don't you and I live in a globalized world? From the produce we find on the shelves of our grocery stores, to the clothes we wear daily, to the cars we drive, our world has become increasingly smaller. Distances are traveled in less and less time, while the internet has allowed for the spread of information instantly. And yet, there is a striking paradox. While we consume the products they make for us, we have very little actual knowledge about others, even when the so-called other is our neighbor. If you had a Muslim neighbor, what would you know about them? I was blessed to have traveled the world, in a large part through my research and career. I am a professor in Islamic studies. I was born in France and started traveling at an early age with my family between what we call the East and the West. I have lived in 12 countries and visited over 50. Deep in my heart is a passion to build bridges. And I am blessed to be doing this in my professional capacity as a professor, a scholar, a writer. What I see in the classroom on a daily basis is a mirror into our society and its most pressing challenges. We in the United States pride ourselves on our religious freedom, but is this freedom being eroded for some? Almost 20 years post 9-11, the prejudice and stereotypes against Muslims are still present. More importantly, they have become deeply rooted. Every semester, I get new students in my classes, and the first thing I need to do is help them unlearn biased information and myths they believe is actual knowledge. As a professor today, a main part of my job is to deconstruct narratives students have been exposed to before exposing them to critical sources of knowledge. For how long? The sad truth is that Islam is largely unknown. Most Americans do not know a Muslim, and Islamic studies is not part of any curriculum prior to the university level for the very few who decide to study it. In my first class, I always quiz my students about what they know or think they know about Islam and Muslims. What do you think I hear? The answers I usually get involve the veil, polygamy, jihad. How could this be the common knowledge about around two billion people, one quarter of our globalized world? Why don't I ever hear that Islam shares the same prophets as its sister religions, Judaism and Christianity? Why don't I ever hear that Mary and Jesus are revered by Muslims? Why don't I ever hear about the scientific contributions made in the medieval Islamic world and how they led to the European Renaissance? For example, the invention of algebra by Al-Khwarizmi, or the invention of surgical instruments by a zahrawi known as, known as the father of surgery or even tools that led to our modern GPS system? Why don't I ever hear that Muslim civilization is based on the Israelite prophecies and the Greek heritage, the exact same roots as Western civilization? Now you see, it's all this that should be the common knowledge about Islam and Muslims. A student recently asked me in class with wavering emotion in her voice, why was I never told 
that Islam shares so many similarities with my Christian faith? Yes. Why? There are two main factors for the state of affairs. The first is a very long history of framing Islam in the Western world, and I will come back to it in a moment. The second is the impact of the insidious loud voice of mainstream media and political discourses on Islam and Muslims. A 2018 study by the University of Alabama showed that terror attacks by Muslims receive, on average, 357 percent more attention than those perpetrated by any other group. Do you think this is random? Well, no. The coverage of Islam and Muslims in mainstream media is the result of a choice, the choice of fear-mongering, the choice of the Islamophobia industry. Yes, an industry. An in-depth investigation was conducted by the Center for American Progress on this industry. They demonstrated that this was an organized network with specific funders and professionals with the set goal of vilifying Islam for political gain. They also demonstrated that between 2001 and 2015, eight identified donors gave $57 million to this network. Have you ever wondered who benefits from hate? It is not you and me. It is those who financially gain from it, from tearing us apart. Now, at times, the paranoia fomented by the media leads to fantastical results. A 2015 public policy poll showed that a considerable number of Americans were in favor of bombing Agrabah. Do you have any idea where Agrabah is located? Well, me neither. It's the fictional city from Disney's Aladdin. <laughs> and this leads me to the first factor. As a historian, I teach my students about how we got here, the very long history of framing Islam in the Western world. As early as the 7th century, Islam was perceived and presented in Europe as a medieval fallacy and a threat. In the following centuries, Muslims were seen through the lens of Orientalism as monsters, but also exotic, and sensual others. In the words of scholar Edward Said, it is Europe that articulates the Orient. In the Ottoman and colonial periods, the Muslim world was seen as a threatening other to be subdued, dominated, civilized. Following the Cold War, Muslims replaced the communist enemy as convenient scapegoats. Today, there are still traces of this prejudice on our own streets, if we paid attention. But do we see these symbols? For example, the Turks' heads in these photos of British streets. In medieval Europe, a Turks' heads pie was a popular dish, one symbolically ate and devoured the head of a Turk. In that time period, Turk was synonymous with Muslim. I wish this were all history behind us, but it's not. Today, Muslims are still constructed as a violent and threatening other. 
Recent studies have shown that Muslims are by far the most discriminated against faith group in the United States. And here is another paradox. Muslims are, in fact, one of the earliest religious groups in the United States. Many enslaved people were Muslim. There has never been an America without Muslims, is the first sentence of a book by scholar Amir Hussein, entitled Muslims and the Making of America. If we knew our history, we would know that Muslims are an integral part of the American social and cultural fabric. From sports, music, to culture, Muslims have shaped American identity. The benefit of being a historian is that you see how certain facts have been erased from our collective memory. We seem to suffer from collective amnesia. But the problem is not just amnesia about how Muslims belong in our nation. It's how they are dehumanized. The Hollywood industry is a perfect example. When I examine movies with my students, they are often perplexed by the tropes and negative portrayals of the Muslim villains they had never paid attention to before. Again, I ask you, do we see prejudice? Or have we become too desensitized to notice? Now, our prejudice against others has consequences. Did we not see this in the 1940s? Today, Islamophobia and targeted killings of Muslims have been on the rise, both in the United States and worldwide. Did you know that in August 2020, an entire family of five was killed in Denver when their house was set on fire? Do you know their crime? They were Muslim. In China, up to 1.5 million Uyghur Muslims are in re-education camps. Their women are being sterilized by force as we speak. And there are many other examples in our globalized world, in Myanmar, India, etc. There is currently something called a Muslim ban. Today, in the United States of America, there are laws targeting Muslims. Experts advising governments say that the change will not happen from the top down because of vested interests in the fear industry. That means that it is upon you and me to transform the status quo. We, as a civil society, have a collective responsibility to counter mainstream narratives of hate and bring our own leaders to accountability when they dehumanize a group of people. So what is our role? Here are four easy steps I share with my students. Number one, build relationships with local Muslims. Make friends with your Muslim neighbor. Meet a Muslim. Genuine friendship is the answer to hate and prejudice. Several studies have recently shown that Americans who interacted with Muslims held more positive views of Islam. So it's time to expand your circles. Every semester, I take my students to the local mosque. It's often a transformative experience for them to meet Muslims for the first time. Muslims were not defined by the media, not defined by the autocratic regimes in the Muslim world, but speaking for themselves. 
If you don't know where to start, visit a chapter of CARE, the Council on American-Islamic Relations, and learn about the Muslim communities near you. If you go to New York City, join a tour that maps out the history of Muslims in the city. Number two, inform yourself and do some fact-checking. Many news networks have an agenda. They color the facts they present to you as their audience. Ask yourself, what is the agenda of your favorite news network? Have you considered other sources of information? Experts say that we should try to rely more on independent media. See if we want reliable medical information, we ask a doctor. But for information on Islam, we trust the media. Remember, that what makes a democracy is an informed citizen. Make sure you are actually informed. Number three, contextualize. Do not essentialize or generalize. We are talking about the faith of almost two billion people, one quarter of our globalized world. Muslims are diverse, just like any other group. Ask yourself, what are your impressions of Islam and Muslims based on? Is it a terrorist organization? Or perhaps governments in the Muslim world? Well, Muslims are the first victims of both. If we want to learn about Christianity, do we look to the Ku Klux Klan? Definitely not. I often ask my students to look at the internal diversity of their own faith traditions and apply that same nuance to any other group. Remember that the stories we tell about others are a reflection of ourselves, our own needs and insecurities. And number four, speak up against racism and prejudice. Stand up against racism and prejudice. Speak out when groups are targeted because of their religious or ethnic identity. Love thy neighbor. Love thy neighbor. And teach your children to do so. Because silence is complicity because it could be you next, because at the end of the day, this is a basic American civil rights religious freedom issue. There are local initiatives waiting for your voice to join them. Jewish and Christian voices against Islamophobia and many others. Now, ask yourself, who do you want to be as a nation? What world do you want to create for your children? It starts with you.